ஒருவேளைட் <laughs> so the assessment consists of uh, uh, detailed clinical history then assessing the educational status sibling status occupation habits handedness pre morbid 24 hours routine and social support this is mandatory scheme of assessment uh, so as we all know cognitive research that is why we should know the educational status uh, cognitive research even in the presence of dementia Uh, when the educational status is better it may look like normal due to environment due to individual characteristics like increased synaptic or neuronal capacity greater efficiency in engaging brain capacity or use alternative strategies for example our hmsc or mini mental status or the various neuropsychiatric tests are too primitive that is categorizing less than 12 school years and more than 12 school years that's all for a highly educated person these are very primitive So they will have the capacity to do much better because of that these tests will show them to be normal so in their activities of daily living they may not uh, suffer whereas in their professional life they will be a problem but cognitive research itself is very important for uh, patients to be looked after by caregivers so that is cognitive research so that is why we have to know the sibling status because we say that siblings have similar iq and uh, so that will help us to compare if the person is uh, subjectively and objectively complaining there is a cognitive decline and we don't find anything and you find that the siblings are uh, having very high iq then you can say this person pre morbid iq is very high because of that is uh, tests are showing him to be normal so that is the relevance of that and then parameters to be assessed one is appearance and behavior consciousness orientation attention concentration vigilance memory intelligence and fund of knowledge judgment abstract thinking new learning capacity calculation and some neuropsychological test many of the things all of us do regularly in a general neurology examination glasgow coma scale is very much uh, known to all of us so it has a score of about 15 so if that score, score is a uh, less than 7 the outcome is very bad so this is just to grossly assess consciousness uh, depth depth of consciousness i am not elaborating this because this is uh, done every day by every one of you uh, then we will go to memory assessment uh, i said that we listen to the patient and do some simple bedside that is what is possible in the examination or in the routine setting so memory uh, assessment question uh, this is a standardized question uh, so we ask the patient do you feel uh, you can remember as well as before so if the person says i i think no then the uh, next question is does this affect this as standardized validated uh, question uniformly recommended for use so does this affect your day to day life and have you seen a doctor for this that is the second question and if it has affected the day to day life that means the instrumental activities of daily living getting affected but we cannot uh, give the type of instrumental activity that each one is uh, doing in his life so that uh, so we have got a set of test which are chosen to test the instrumental activity so if the person says that his day to day life is affected by his cognitive decline because each one's lifestyle is different you cannot give a uniform test for everyone so there is a common test which most of us 
uh, do in our life that is used. So that is reading a map. Grassly, you give the map of India and tell them to point out their native state. And preparing a meal, shopping groceries, how do they do? Then making phone calls. So these are common activities that everyone does. So these are the four tests chosen for testing instrumental activities of daily living after the patient says that he's affected and it affects his life. Then uh, we will take a general health measure. So now we know that patient has got a cognitive complaint which is subjective and there is some objective involvement of uh, his uh, functional capacity and instrumental activities of daily living. So you know that he has a problem. So then go to the general health measures, whether he has any neurological disorder, does he have epilepsy, does he have stroke, MS, uh, and does he have any endocrine problem, any other complicating issues like uh, common uh, health problems like diabetes, hypertension, and all of them directly and indirectly affect the nervous system. Does he have al alcohol, smoking, and uh, you can do the Framingham combined cardiovascular risk score for a patient with dyslipidemia, diabetes, hypertension, endocrine disorders, what is his cardiovascular risk score? That is extrapolated into neurovascular risk score. So that patient may be suffering from a vascular cognitive complaint. That gives you some gross idea by the second parameter, general health measures. Third is the depression. So a depressed person will do very badly in the scores and he will be subjectively or objectively impaired but it is completely reversible dementia. It is very, very important. Many times you will be surprised. Recently, we had a patient whose score was five and his wife was telling him completely erratic, get lost, confused. And when I asked, he gets agitated. But when we, uh, uh, and the score was five, HMSC score was five. And, but when we investigated, all the investigations were normal. Then when I kept the, family members outside and spoke to the patient. He is having several crores of uh, loan. He was doing some bone crushing business, something he was selling, and he is unable to pay it back. And he was in severe depression. So then uh, we knew that, and it is easily treatable, but it is so much uh, incapacitating, it is as bad as dementia. So look for baseline depression. Uh, so this is a first screening, first level screening. This can be done by a trained cognitive nurse. Then you go to the uh, tests of cognition. So if somebody is in a cognitive clinic, the three, the three things that we said can be, you have got a uh, geriatric depression scale for India. So that scale very easy to apply and, uh, and, and a dementia clinic uh, nurse can do it. After that, you come to the cognitive assessment where mini mental status examination, which is a 30 point score, or Hindi mental status examination. Uh, mini mental status examination is a paid score. So we use the HMS. Then clinical dementia rating scale, structured interview with the patient, and telephonic interview with the informant of the patient. Uh, if the person is not available, I will elaborate all this. Then uh, you use test for immediate and delayed memory visuospatial uh, construction, language capacity, attention, and global deterioration scale. Then uh, next is the activities of daily living for which you depend on the carers. How is he taking care of? We have seen the initial screening, instrumental activity, four point screening is done by the nurse. And then you are asking for the carer report. Then you do the other uh, blessed dementia rating scale, behavior uh, scale, easy everyday activity score for India and Bristol's de uh, depression score. So these are the things which are commonly applied in any memory clinic. And what is the difference between mini mental status and indie mental status? Hindi mental status is more simplified, 31 point. Mini mental status little more complex. And the second mini mental uh, status is Paid one, this is a free one. So we have to these questions on the year, name of the place, building, floor, street, address, city, country. You know, then uh, you have to repeat three names for registration, which are changed into simple ones. Then recall serial subtraction that is modified into a simple test using rupees. Then a backward spelling of the world that is uh, converted into simplified backward mentioning of the days of the week. Then you can recall 
then name common objects, then uh, repeat no ifs or buts, then uh, obey simple commands, write a sentence and draw intersecting pentagons there. Here it is a uh, rectangle with a diamond inside. So these are the difference here. Mm, so this score, if it is less than 25, for 24 for more than 12 school years and less than 19 for less than 12 school years is considered cognitive decline. Then this is the clinical dementia rating scale uh, where uh, the several domains are tested. This also can be downloaded. I will not elaborate because each test will take one class. But I'm just introducing these are the things easily you can download, apply to five patients, then you know what it is. So you test the domain of memory, orientation, judgment and problem solving, then uh, community affairs, home hobbies and personal care. care. And in this score, if it is 0.5, it is normal and uh, varying severities, I uh, will grade it into grade one, two, three. This can be taken from the uh, net, downloaded and apply five times, then you will know how to apply this. Hmm? Then key points to remember in neuropsychological test. Neuropsychological tests are altered by several factors from time to time. Last, like I, I told a patient whose score was five, when I personally spoke to him and he opened up his problem, his score became full. That was only 24 hours difference. So neuropsychological tests are altered by in, in indifference of the patient to cooperate your answers. Then the score will be very bad. That does not mean disease. So we should know that if he has taken some tranquilizer, if he has uh, sleep deprived, all this will change the scores. Then one test may be abnormal in several situations because if one test naming defect is there naming defect can be part of a uh, cognitive decline it can be part of a uh, demanding disease it can be part of a language disorder focal problems so so many things can affect uh, one parameter is abnormal just put that parameter is abnormal what is the substrate underlying that parameter abnormality we will have to finally only conclude and several tests can be affected due to one problem, for example, if a patient has got an aphasia, then all the tests are going to be affected. That does not mean that the whole brain is affected. When the patient's language is affected, he will not comprehend, he will not reply properly. So it will look like that all domains are affected, whereas only one domain is affected, that is the language domain. And interpret giving relevance to the context. The patient who is uh, suddenly sitting with a person who has probably irritated him, it uh, said some angry word or something like that. The or new person introduced for the first time to a new setup. That will affect them in the uh, performance, so you may have to repeat it. So all these are shortcomings of neuropsychological test. Therefore, history is the most important thing as I had insisted in the previous test, but these are things to be done. We have got regions, we have got domains, as you know. In the older times, we used to think frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, occipital lobe, corpus callosum, cerebellum, like that. Now we are thinking that most of the functions are distributed in networks. So we have got domains. Now what is this uh, domains we are going to uh, check and what are the regions? Regions, you know, the various lobe, that's a lobe function. And domains are language, attention, orientation, executive function, Praxis, gnosis, social cognition, and theory of mind and spatial orientation. Of which, uh, in the first session, I have spoken about attention orientation. The language, we can do another session if needed. Praxis, I have done. Others, if you need only, I will ask. I am doing the test because some students asked me uh, to put a grass thing. Because each one is a separate session. Uh, if anybody is interested, you just put it on the mail, then I can do it. Otherwise, with this session, I am planning to close the dementia and go to the other topics which students have asked me. So we know that we have got five functional networks. Regions, I told, frontal, parietal, temporal, occipital, corpus callosum, cerebellum. And uh, networks, these are miscellaneous. This, are the, this concept comes from Mislam. This is a textbook on cognitive dysfunction written by Mislam. So he says five networks. One is the perisylvian language networks, parieto frontal network for spatial orientation, occipital temporal network for face and object recognition, 
limbic network for memory, prefrontal network for attention and behavior. Then how do we test attention and memory? Now, I am not elaborating these tests because you have to do it yourself and then only you become familiar. So attention is tested by digit forward, whereas working memory is tested by digit backward. Working memory is digit backward because you hold the numbers in your mind. So digit forward and backward can be up to eight. If it is less than five, it is definitely abnormal. Um, but normally forward and backward can be eight and repeat similar uh, list backwards. So you can uh, list of names which can be told to repeat backward. Call out months of the year backward and take note down the time taken, commission, omission, errors. These are standardized. So this is a test of attention and working memory. Then random letter vigilance test. You can tell that I will be going on telling some letters. Every time I tell you, yeah, A, yeah, raise your hands. That's a test of vigilance. Read 60 letters at one per second, a number of errors. So you have to uh, standardize 60 letters, give some time, then note the commission, omission, and perseveratory errors. And this can be compared with the educational status of the patient and standardized norm for that educational status. Then alternative sequence copying. So that you can do whether there is any defect in the Luria's fist edge palm test. I will show the picture subsequently. Uh, fist edge palm uh, test that uh, how fast they are. Are they having perseverate errors? Are they clumsy? All this can be tested. Then go no go test. That is uh, tap once. If I tap twice, that means patient has to be very attentive. When the examiner taps twice, patient will have to tap once. And don't tap if I tap once. These are all standardized tests. Very easily it can be done. Only thing you have to become familiar and learn that. And so that means if the examiner taps twice, then patient will tap once. And if the examiner taps once, he will keep quiet. Yeah, so then that means he is having attention and vigilance. Then visual uh, grasp is look away from the stimulant. You show your finger here and tell him you should look to the right side. Mm, that is that all modified go-no-go -no -go test. Then this is a stroop test. Uh, stroop color and word test. That is attention and set shifting. You see that uh, it is written in violet red. So patient at one point has to read only the color. Next time he has to read the letter. That means at one point he is suppressing the color and reading the letter. Next time he is suppressing the letter and reading the color. Each one is standardized how much time he takes. Sometimes first you may read red, then coming to the blue you may tell yellow. So there will be uh, errors where you mix up everything. You shift from one to the another and read properly and uh, there is a fixed time in which based on your education, this should be finished. So there is a standardized performa available where the normative data is there. Compare it with the normative data and say that uh, whether it is right or wrong. This is called stroop test. Then we have got a test for verbal fluency, category fluency, digit forward, digit backward. And this is a motor uh, speed. The uh, motor speed test is by the finger tapping test. You use the index finger and five trials of 10 seconds is given and each hand uh, he has to uh, tap on this and how many, uh, how much time he is taking and uh, how is he slow, fast or clumsy and that is an index of motor speed. This is called finger tapping test for motor speed. It's a simple machine available in the neuropsychology lab. And this is a uh, letter frequency. F, A, S test. How many words he can create with letter F, A, and S. And total number of words produced, usually it is about 15 words per letter uh, and, uh, normally. And if it is uh, less, it is a reduced letter fluency. And you can see this is the Luria's test, as I told, fist edge palm test of Luria sequence, a task that requires patient to imitate three hand motions performed by a clinician. And it is a test of uh, frontal lobe function because you have to inhibit one moment, go to the next moment and do it in a sequential way. Instead, patient may perceive it, he may be clumsy, he may not uh, go from one moment to another. And uh, these are the various hands position. 
uh, fist, edge, and palm. This is shown. And patient has to do it the same uh, alternating pattern. This alternating will be lost and perseveratory arrest will happen in frontal lobe uh, problem. A modified Lurias test, you have got the fist and the ring test. And then you have got reciprocal incubation. It is like stroop test. In the stroop test, you are inhibiting the color ones, you are inhibiting the letter ones. Here you are doing alternate hand positions. That will, uh, these are all more simplified tests of the same uh, function. And here you can do the uh, sig uh, zigzag line where patient will show perseveratory elements, errors either of the triangle or of the rectangle. So these are the various other frontal attention related tests. Then you have got a mental flexibility. This is for mental flexibility, trial A and trial B. You want to connect the numbers in trial A without crisscrossing. In trial B, between the numbers and the letters, you have to alternate. So number one, go to A. Then number two, go to B. And it should not crisscross. These are for uh, mental flexibility, just for mental flexibility. Then you have got a visual motor speed. Visual motor, see and perform. Visual motor speed is here for each number, a symbol is given. Each number, a symbol is given. And you have to quickly, quickly put the symbol corresponding to the number. And how much time you take? That's a test of visual motor speed. You see with the vision and carry out motor. So this is a visual motor speed. That is all. All these are standardized tests. Whatever I am telling, right from the questionnaire, with which the nurse can give, everything is a standardized neuropsychological test. And this, then you have got a, this is another example of a, uh, letter symbol substitution, different letters, different symbols. So uh, previously I showed some kind of symbols. This is another kind of symbol, little more complex. Then uh, number connection test. This is uh, again number connection is a modified trial test with little more complex, little more educated, bigger numbers, two digit numbers. Then you have got a letter cancellation test. Here you can tell the patient to uh, cancel A. So how many years he is cancelling and how much time he is taking for cancelling yes in this page? Is he can cancelling B instead of A? So that is a letter cancellation test, again a test of attention. Then this is digit cancellation, number cancellation. Then this is a verbal working memory. What is working memory? I have told it in the first session. That is ability to hold information for short period and manipulate. So here, what is this verb uh, test? You tell one back means when I tell G, A, uh, Ga and Ja. Then patient should tell Ga. So when I tell sell the second one, patient should tell the first one. That means he is holding the first one in his mind and suppressing the second one and going back to the first one. That is why working memory is holding something in your mind, manipulating for a short period for functional efficiency. So that is the basis of this test. One back is you will hold jaw and tell ga. Two back is when NA, GA, NA is given, patient will hold the latest two and go back to the first one. So he will have to go two steps backwards. Little more complex. So working memory of very short duration will one back will be all right, two back will be difficult. These are standardized. There's a time and education based errors of omission and commission standardized norm is there. So this is one back, two back test is a test of verbal working memory. This is visual working memory. This is a table patient will have and examiner will have. This is with the uh, patient and examiner will have it. A reverse <laughs> like this. So there is a standard pattern in which the examiner will touch these squares, looking at that number list. So patient has to keep this in his brain and uh, touch up appropriately. So uh, visual working memory. If the examiner touched the first one and the uh, second one and the fifth one, the candidate also has to touch like that. The fixed numbers and pattern is there. Uh, that will not be visible to the uh, candidate. It is visible to the examiner. So the same pattern patient has to re reproduce. Then abstract thinking and judgment. 
that you give a uh, proverb as you know proverb has got a concrete meaning and an abstract meaning concrete meaning is the verbal meaning of that proverb concrete meaning is the hidden meaning so patient has to get the hidden meaning of a of abstract like uh, what is um, uh, the, like golden hammer opens sign doors uh, so it only opens sign doors so that means uh, just because you are a golden golden hammer you are not a great person or all that is why it is not milk we tell that means why it may be lotion also so just because it is white don't go and drink it the abstract meaning is that apparently what looks like is not really that be very cautious so abstract meaning patient should be able to tell then uh, i explain why conceptually linked words are the same what is the similarity that is what the person has to tell between these words uh, then uh, plan and structure a sequential set of activities so how will you do these things so that patient will arrange the pattern how he will bake a cake or how he will start a car and uh, and insight and reaction to his own illness react to a given situation these are all a test of abstraction and judgment then you have got the uh, complete a circle uh, patient will go on drawing several several lines perseveratory errors so he will not have a response inhibition so he will be going on drawing many circles then uh, apraxia i have that done a uh, full session uh, in the last class i think so that you can go back and uh, read it i am not going to repeat that because full session on this aspect itself i have done and if it is needed i can again do it uh, do other things but this is fully their last class only i did full things i am not uh, wasting time on <coughs> all this is there in the previous session because it is part of uh, uh, neurocognitive assessment i put it here construction apraxia idiomotor apraxia complex figure of and then your uh, boston's cookies uh, theft picture patient has to describe the various things which are so you observe interpret and explain what are all the activities seen in this picture and that how many activities are picked by the patient how many activities are omitted by the patient and it is interpreted according to <coughs> his education then uh, so what he is seeing in the picture you will ask them and the moment uh, he started he has to describe the scene and finished when the individual indicated that there is nothing more so he says that i have seen and i have described everything i saw then you find out how much time was taken how many parameters were left and it can be affected by agnosia or neglect if there is agnosia he may not see things if there is neglect he may not see from one area and if his cognitive uh, capacity is poor he will omit many of the observations like that then uh, uh, in, uh, the agnosia part i have not covered so this is agnosia you have got two things apperceptive agnosia and associative agnosia what is apperceptive agnosia you see you see an object it is long it is having a round end this is another instrument with so many holes and this is uh, an object with a big gone small arm so that is gestalt you interpret the shape size color intensity angulation if that is not at all appreciated and the patient is not recognizing that object that in the presence of normal vision it is apperceptive agnosia if he is appreciating all this but still he is not recognizing the object that is associative agnosia so a person with an apperceptive agnosia cannot copy a picture because he is not perceiving the contour whereas a person with an associative agnosia he can copy because he is uh, getting all the contour but he doesn't have the concept he will not recognize so both apperceptive and associative agnosia patients cannot uh, uh, recognize but a person with apperceptive cannot copy also a person with associative can copy because the gestalt is there and both of them can reproduce from the memory that indicates a perceptive circuit uh, associative circuit and memory circuits are different tell him to draw a spoon from your memory then he will draw draw a flute from memory he will draw that's a different circuit so that is agnosia end organ is normal either you perceive and don't recognize 
or you don't perceive at all and don't recognize even though your eye is normal but your mental imagery is normal that that is agnosia then you have got to neglect when there is a neglect you have got a page with so many lines you tell the patient to cut all the uh, lines some lines will be not cut that means that side there is a neglect or a hemianopia so this is again uh, a sheet where you tell the patient to cancel letters that is a line cancellation this is letter cancellation this is a test for judgment this is a um, tower of london tower of london has got uh, six balls of different colors and there are fixed positions which the patient should put he should not uh, put any ball on the table he should only shift between the three poles and how much time he takes to receive the three fixed positions which are standardized and the colors in that order so this uh, so that he has to do and you find out how many omission commission errors are coming he should not put any ball on the table he should only exchange between the poles and reach the uh, test positions which are given in the standard battery and this is wisconsin cord sorting test here we have got 60 cords with the four samples stars square diamond and round and you don't tell the patient uh, any rule you will tell the patient that i will say yes if you are correct what i am thinking in my mind and the rule will change every 10 correct placement after 10 cards are placed it will change so you are 60 cards so when the first uh, card is shown let us imagine he is seeing two stars and the second card is shown he is seeing two rounds and the examiner says correct that means what is common between do, these two it is not the color it is not the star it is the number so patient has to understand from that my examiner is now matching with the number because that is the common between these two so next when you show the diamond when it is two he will say yes next when this is shown two he will say yes so for next 10 cards that will be like that after the 10th card it will change maybe the examiner will match by the color so you saw four green and uh, three diamonds then uh, it is same it so the examiner is now matching with the color so no no command instruction is given he will not be told now match with the color no match with the number so patient has to understand when the examiner says yes what is common so my examiner told yes that you will apply for the next 10 cards and from the 11th card a new matching will come that is wisconsin card sorting test it is for abstract thinking and set shifting so the uh, so the uh, these cards are uh, tested uh, as uh, this is what i described about the card sorting test then you have got a global dementia rating scale so we, we this is uh, uh, using these parameters uh, whether the patient is independent or uh, for so, so then it will uh, based on the scores uh, we divide it into mild cognitive impairment subjective cognitive decline early dementia moderate dementia severe dementia and severe complex uh, care so that is based on the on this uh, global deterioration scale will uh, find out the activities the person can do and then categorizes them into varying severity this is not an assessment of um, domains or regions it is assessment of severity then this is the very simple depression scale which should be there in any cognitive and yesterday when he was called alone his score was 31 so that was severe depression then and his wife uh, uh, did not tell us that he has any problem he says a very rich man and a very happy man but later he told he has scores of loan which he has not revealed to the family so that was severe depression so that can be easily managed so this is the depression scale which should be there in every a dementia file because it is easily reversible dementia uh, this is another scale for dementia uh, then you have got a blessed dementia scale so this is also another functional assessment we have the hms mmc to screen for entry then various tests for various domains then we have got a um, simple activities what are the activities that are 
getting affected in your patients. So inability to perform household work. When you are cooking, you are confused whether salt is to be added or sugar is to, to be added, whether your calculation domain. So what are the domains that are affected? That is tested by these questions. Uh, so that is useful for rehabilitation. So what domain is affected in your patient? That domain can be rehabilitated. So these different, different scales are there with different, different motives. Then uh, what are the habits that, that have changed? Eating, dressing. Uh, bladder bowel control. Then uh, personality traits which have changed. Has they become obstinate? So what are all the uh, personality traits? All this you will document so that one thing, we can educate the caregiver why they are doing. Second, certain domains can be rehabilitated. So this is a domain-based assessment of uh, dysfunction. Then uh, what are the abilities the patient has and what are the abilities which are uh, lost in the situation. So that is tested by this EC score. This is also available. Uh, anybody can download and use it. Then we have got the PJ memory battery, which is uh, uh, made in Chandigarh. So you have got a memory uh, test performer with the 10 items, remote memory, recent memory, attention, concentration, mental balance, delayed recall, immediate recall, verbal returns of similar fires, dissimilar fires, visual retention and visual recognition. This, uh, you know, several levels of tests are there. This is the primitive screening in a dementia clinic. I am giving you this because comprehensively you will not get it. So you go through this and you have to only apply because I will not be able to apply each score for a very simple ones. So primitive screening. Once you have done this screening, higher screening scores, too many of them are there that can be applied. But in any dementia case, this mix should be there. And uh, so this is uh, five cards for visual retention, two cards, one with 10 common objects and uh, one with 20 common objects. You have to pick up the 10 objects you saw in the uh, first card. You carry a stopwatch, pencil, and a pen. So these are the, I will show the five cards for visual retention. So patient has to re register this one, uh, which increasing complexity. And then he has to reproduce these five cards for visual uh, retention. And then uh, you have got a remote memory questions. These are very simple questions. These are standardized. That is the thing. These questions have been given to several hundred patients and standard answers have been recorded and standardized for age and education. So that is why these questions should not be modified. You have to use the message. Then recent memory, uh, you have got uh, questions. That is the previous paper contained the remote memory questions. This is the recent memory question. As it will be there for you some more time, you can go through this again and again. Then for mental balance, you can tell the alphabets uh, forward or counting backwards numbers. What is the time taken? Errors of commission and omission. Then we have got uh, each, uh, you have got a uh, digit forward and digit backward. So that is for attention concentration. PGA battery is also using the digit forward and backward only, uh, like your standard form. Then you have got uh, 10 common objects. These are the, I will show you this. Uh, these are the 10 common objects. These objects a patient can see for one minute and he has to register these objects. The next one is uh, 20 objects are there, of which the previous 10 is also here. So patient has to pick up the previous 10 from this 20. So that is for visual uh, retention memory. And the whole data is scored, and you have got what is the normal score. This is a uh, learning and memory score. This is a story. And this story is called Asha Kumari story. This story contains so many parameters, what happened, uh, how the lady leaves the police station, what are all the things that happened there. So that is told elaborately and all the points the patient has to recall. How many is recalled in the step of the, this is called Asha Kumari story. It's a standardized story for learning and memory. And all the parameters which are omitted or committed uh, which are not there in the score should be documented. This is for learning and memory. Then we have got the caregiver burden scale. This is called SARI scale. 
So uh, many of these caregivers will have a lot of confusion because they will think uh, that uh, um, uh, patient is uh, comforting me when I am uh, happy, happy. But when I am crying, he doesn't bother. I am looking after my patient every day, but he says he doesn't know my name, but he knows the name of my uh, brother who is coming once in four years. So that means, so these are the things that will make the caregiver feel sad, even though they know their father is, or mother is sick. Why are they differentiating between us like that and all? They will have questions. Because of that, they become burdened and their burden can result in ill health for the caregiver or they may ignore the patient. So this we have to tell them that there can be differential circuits. So familiar face circuit might have degenerated. Whereas an unfamiliar face, the person who is seen once in four years, that circuit has not degenerated. That is why he is differentially behaving. Similarly, emotion appreciation, crying face appreciation and laughing face appreciation is different. Your patient's crying face appreciation would have degenerated. So when you cry, he's unable to understand and comfort. So you get the caregiver score and educate the caregiver what is care affecting him, then the caregiver uh, suffering will come down. So caregiver will take care of the patient better and he himself will not suffer. So it is the caregiver care that is very, very important in patients with cognitive decline. Then from all these tests that we went through, some tests are selected in him. This is what is done in the National Institute. So innumerable tests are there, of which some tests are taken, and each one becomes that battery for that institute. So if you have sent a patient to Nimans and he says Nimans battery is uh, normal, that means these are the tests they have done. Say they do the finger tapping test I showed, motor speed, and digit symbol substitution for mental speed, that also I showed you. And you have got the color trial, that is uh, shift from this color to that color, and digit vigilant, that is, tap a test. So these are the tests that are uh, chosen, category fluency, number of animals, uh, in uh, number of animals you know of in five minutes. And verbal working memory, that's the N back, two back. Spatial spans, troop test, Tower of London, Wisconsin court sorting test. So Neumann's battery constitutes this test. And token test for comprehension. And test of learning and memory is the Asha story. And complex figure of Ray, and uh, apraxia and agnosia tests. Uh, and these are the uh, tests that are done in the Niemann's battery. So if Niemann's battery is done means you will understand these are the tests that have been done. Then we have to sum up, we have got frontal lobe is for the emotional makeup, personality, attention, working memory, abstraction, planning, judgment, and language. So we have we seen through the domains, these are the lobes. Temporal lobe means language, auditory function, verbal function, visual recall, memory, and face recognition. And uh, parietal lobe means uh, neglect, uh, visuospatial, geographic orientation, praxis, calculation, reading, and writing. Occipital lobe means uh, cortical blindness, field defects, visual agnosia, simultognosia. So these are the lobe region-based interpretation, domain-based interpretation, what is PGA battery, what is Niemann's battery, I have told. So now we have a patient who has a memory complaint. It is short duration means you see whether there is raised intracranial pressure. And if there is no raised intracranial pressure, think of infections, drugs, trauma, <coughs> vascular, endocrine, metabolic, and autoimmune causes. Then uh, it is long duration. Then find out whether it is memory or mimic. If it is a uh, real memory, it may be benign forgetfulness of old age or mild cognitive impairment. If it is uh, uh, mimic means it may be prolonged depression. If it is mild cognitive impairment, is it amnesic or non-amnesic? Is it single domain or multi-domain? The amnesic ones, you have to be careful. They were progress to AD. Then uh, whether the pay, uh, other parts of the CNS is involved or not. So if there is a long duration, we have said it may be SCD, it can be uh, MCA and single domain, multi domain, amnesic, non amnesic. So that's okay. Then, what are the other parts involved? Uh, if the other parts of the uh, 
um, brain is not involved, it is cortical dementia. If other parts are involved, it may be subcortical dementia. And uh, when uh, then the what is the duration? When did the 24 hours routine of the patient change? The first questionnaire that the nurse will give, I have told, is the 24 hours routine and when it changed. That is the duration of the disease. Because patients relative will say only yesterday he is like this. Yesterday he may be delirious and incontinent. But this routine would have changed four years ago. As long as it did not affect the bystander, they will not tell us. So that change is the duration of the disease. Then where, what started the change? Did it start with delirium? If the change started with delirium, the possibilities are CJD, trucks, autoimmune, endocrine, infection, and nutritional causes. And uh, if it is language, is it static or progressive? If it is language and static, it may be strategic infarct dementia. If it is progressive, it may be primary progressive aphasia or semantic variant of frontotemporal dementia. Then if there is a uh, problem we started with the frontal lobe, it may be frontotemporal dementia, small vessel disease, Parkinson's dementia complex, MND, ALS, and frontal type of CBD. If we started with the parietal lobe, it is AD, DLPD, or corticobasal degeneration. If we started with the temporal lobe, AD, uh, uh, or temporal onset FTD. If we started with the occipital lobe, it is DLBD, sometimes the hidden hams variant of CJD. Then uh, if the uh, procedural memory was impaired first, not the amnesia, then it may be subcortical dementia like PSP, PDD, CBD, vascular, Huntington's disease, NPA, spinal cerebral ataxia, neurodegeneration with brain ion accumulation and DRPLS. And uncharacterized overlap, that is mixed dementia, degenerative dementia, can coexist with vascular dementia. It can coexist with the infections. Then it is unclassified and uncharacterized overlap dementia. Then you, are, uh, you have to differentiate pseudo dementia from true dementia. Pseudo dementia is uh, depression. As I said, very important to differentiate. Patient will keep on insisting I have memory problem. There will be a definite date. This person, as I told the example, he started the day when he started failing in his business. And he will simply give, I don't know answer. That is why the first day score was five. Reason and remote memory is come totally lost. The answer phenomenon is near normal answers. What is four plus four? He purposely wants to tell wrong answers. So he will say seven or nine. And he will look depressed. Dopamine is the neurotransmitter. EG will show expectancy wave. P300 and PET will be normal. Whereas true dementia, others will tell he will deny. And the onset is very vague and ill-defined. Wrong answers are more common than I don't know answers. Recent memory is impaired and remote is preserved. The answer phenomenon is not there. Depression may or may not be there, depending on the insight into the illness. Neurotransmitter involved is acetylcholine. And EEG uh, will be generally showing changes of the type of dementia. P300 and PET will be abnormal. Then what is the difference between cortical and subcortical? Cortical is quick and wrong answers to questions. Patient is usually happy because no, generally no insight. They may have agnosia, aphasia, apraxia, seizures, and myoclonus. And usually, yes, uh, estoperamidal and motor features are late, and acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter. Subcortical, the cortex is normal. So the processing time, we saw the test of mental speed and the motor speed. So in a patient with subcortical dementia, the mental speed and the motor speed will be low. So they will be slow and right. There may be apathy and depression. Cortical symptoms like agnosia, aphasia, apraxia, seizures, myoclonus are not there. And estoperamidal and the motor features are rarely. Neurotransmitter involved is GABA and dopamine. So I have given a quick review of the uh, standardized tests that are being carried on in the common memory clinics of this country. One is the PJ, second is the NMS, and the common test for domains and regions. There are innumerable tests which you can test, uh, choose based on your research purpose. But these tests are easy to apply, but nobody can teach you to apply it to at least five times, then you learn this. So thank you.
Thank you, madam. Uh, one question uh, has been asked: What is Inion signs? Madam. What is? Inion sign. Inion. I N I O N. I am not aware of a sign. Is it a sign in dementia? Why did not. you say that, Mawet? I have not heard of a test like that. If anyone is aware, he can contribute. Or the person who asked might have read it somewhere. Then please explain. I am not aware because many people would have described many many signs, and uh, what we commonly used only, uh, uh, I have told, and I am not aware of a sign like that. Uh, you can, uh, I can refer if possible until I, I am not aware. Is there any such test? The person who asked, if you know, please tell it. Tell it to us. Anything else? Mm, no other questions, ma'am. Okay, then we'll close. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, madam. We'll ask. Hopefully, someone volunteers. I think applying this on the bedside, it will become easier with exam. Yes. With cases. So this is because some DM students asked me. Uh, that's why I put. I know it is not for uh, MBBS or MD. So somebody asked me, so I put. Mm -hmm. So I know I am now making these PPTs based on what students asked me. That's yes. Thank you. Thank you. Shall we close? Yes, madam.